Hello and welcome everybody to the fourth and final installment of our North Carolina Canid Critters Catching Carnivore series uh, from North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. I'm Brent Pease. And I'm Mike Coe from the uh, visiting from the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And we're researchers with the Canid Critters Project, of course, which is a volunteer ran camera trapping project across North Carolina, uh, North, across the state of North Carolina, where we're interested in the distribution and abundance of wildlife across the state. Uh, see wildlife, do science, of course. And today, on our last installment of the Catching Carnivore series, we're focusing on the fox species that occur here. Right. And, and lucky you, it's a two-for-one special today. That's right. It not, sure is. Not to give out any spoilers or spoiler alert, excuse me. Uh, we have two, the red and the gray fox in the state, which we hope to be able to cover just an overview of the species and some of the neat facts that, uh, that differentiates the two. Mm -hmm. um, and, <clears throat> of course, to start out, we want to look at some of the favorite photos that we have gotten across the state. Um, and the first one, of course, here is uh, from Montgomery County. Uh, this is what I would call an iconic red fox species, right? I, I think this is probably the most iconic global fox species, right? So this is the species that everyone thinks about when they hear the term fox. So this is Volpes Volpes, the red fox. Uh, it, it's located on uh, five continents now, right? And so um, this, this is really, really neat species. You can see quite elegant, uh, really red there, nice black uh, legs are a distinguishing feature and then you can see a little bit of dark guard hairs on the tail But that tip it, it's difficult to see but uh, is white is is bright white And so this is actually a photo during the day So it's real nice and easy to tell that this is a red fox walking through uh, You know looks like a, a pretty young forest patch uh, a nice little sighting here. Yeah, this is a great photo We really get good color on on the coat uh, sun shining, beautiful photo of Montgomery County. Yeah. Uh, again, we have another red fox species. This one coming from Wake. Wait, so how could you tell that? Oh man, that's a great <laughs> question. So here in Wake County, so we have those really dark black legs or black mittens right. or black socks. Uh, you can call them what you want, but they're very much a distinguishing feature of the red fox species. And this one's a really cool photo. It looks like it's coming right at the camera. Probably curious of what's going on. Yeah, uh, it might it might hear uh, the camera triggering. Uh, red foxes have great sense of hearing, uh, but uh, you know he's looking right at it, and it, it seems as though you know maybe they can see. This is obviously an infrared camera, mm -hmm. so maybe they see a little bit on that infrared spectrum, and th they could see the light a little bit more than, uh, say, us humans, uh, that we don't even notice the light shining. But what I think is cool about this photo is you can see in the background there that's a, a gate to someone's fence, right? So this is in Wake County. Pretty developed area, lots of suburbs, uh, uh, obviously Raleigh, big city there. And so this is pretty neat because you can see a, a fence, a gate in the background, and uh, what looks like ornamental trees. So this is pretty clearly in, right in someone's backyard. So this is, this is a neat sighting. Oh, neat. Yeah. Okay, the next photo is coming out of Moore County, and this might not look like the last, uh, uh, last two photos. This, of course, is our gray fox that we have in this state. Uh, how can we tell this, Mike? Right, so uh, so the, the characteristics of the gray fox, it's a little bit smaller, right? Uh, uh, quite smaller, but it's also, um, you know, it has that, that dark, much darker pelage. You can see the legs are, are still uh, quite lighter. Um, uh, light underbelly, light chin, and then a dark streak across the back with uh, the, the dark tip tail. Yeah, this is a really cool photo. Again, we have another, the fox is looking at the camera, uh, probably hears something, maybe sees something. Right. Uh, pretty neat. Right, right. So this is a, a nice, sleek, once again, pretty elegant, looking right at the camera. Uh, uh, looks like it, it's definitely a, a gray fox again. Mm -hmm. So this is from Craven County, and you can see, uh, well, heck, you know, the, the beauty of the camera traps is they they collect the, the time and the date. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that this photo was taken uh, February, this last February. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's winter. Uh, and, and so you can see that fox has, has looks like quite a big winter coat on it. Oh, uh, and, and just w cruising through the forest there. Uh, you know, these aren't species that hibernate or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so, uh, 
yeah, just he's looking for for food. It's pretty neat. You can see, you can see that it sits a little bit lower to the ground yeah. than just a typical red fox. Yeah, yeah. And it also has a distinguishing characteristic uh, black tip on the tail. Right. We can start to see some of the stripe that goes up the tail, but these are some of the ways you'll be able to tell the difference between these two species when you uh, come across them out uh, when you're out in the woods or, or walking around on your property. Uh, also, I'd like to point out it kind of has a cat-like feature in its face. Yeah. Uh, and, and we'll see more about this here uh, pretty soon when we think about how these species are different. But uh, one of the really neat adaptations of the, of the uh, gray fox species is it's actually able to climb trees. Uh, right. It can climb trees to avoid predators or just get away from anything that it doesn't want to be near. Uh, in the scientific literature, we've had it uh, been documented as high as 60 feet up a tree. Wow. Uh, and then it'll jump from branch to branch. Up wow, there. that's uh, pretty So pretty neat, pretty neat and definitely different from its uh, red fox. Uh, that it'll come across in the state of North Carolina. Right. A couple more exciting photos here, right? Uh, just a couple more to, to wrap up the, the queue of beautiful photos. Well, this one's really, really exciting for me because this is in my backyard in Zebulon uh, here in Eastern Wake County. And so what's neat here is you can see, uh, uh, Brent just talked about the, the, the gray foxes climbing trees. Well, this fox isn't quite climbing a tree, but you can see he's up there elevated on a, on an old uh, log stump. Sure. So pretty cool, right right in my backyard. Probably trying to get a little uh, bird's eye view for a little hunting yeah, opportunity yeah, in that backyard. Yeah, it seems like it. That's for cool. Sure. That's real neat. Yeah, thank you. And then here's another. Uh, this is a, a different example of a, of a camera photo because this isn't the classic infrared photo. This is more of, a, of an LED flash, right? A light flash. And so you can see Obviously, the foxes aren't going to stare directly into uh, the flash of this type of camera. But what's nice is, even though it's at night, we can get a, a really, really good uh, uh, color visual of that beautiful pelage on that gray fox. So we wanted to show that because we, we showed you that, that nice daytime photo of the red fox. Mm. Uh, and so here you can see that, that nice pelage of a, of a flash photo with the gray fox. So you could see that difference. Yeah, I love this photo, and I think what's really neat, just from these few photos that we've that we've seen, uh, these two species are quite different. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of diverse, uh, a lot of diversity in the fox species uh, globally. Is, right? Is, is that right, Mike? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And so, you know, the question really is, what is a fox, right? And so, uh, um, I'm sure most people might not realize, but there's actually 37 species of foxes uh, distributed on every continent except Australia. And so these are, this is just kind of a, a, a whole grouping of some iconic fox species that maybe you've heard of, maybe not, but uh, you could see, you know, the, the, the really iconic white fox, the, the Arctic fox, mm -hmm. right, uh, from, from the whole Arctic Circle. You have uh, species like the fennec fox, the smallest fox of all the fox species, with, from Sub-Saharan Africa with these giant ears. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, obviously in the middle you have the, the red fox to the, to the left and the gray fox to the right with the, with the swift fox in the middle there. And then, uh, you know, another one I always like to point out, which is the bad-eared fox in the, in the bottom left corner, mm -hmm. also from Sub-Saharan Africa. And so these are, this is just a, a little sampling of all the, all the variety of foxes that we have uh, globally. And so really, really neat uh, species. Or groups of species, sure, right? Sure. So they're they're related. There's some relation. They are them. related. Yes, they are related. And so uh, foxes are canines, right? They're they're canids. Uh, they are in the same family as dogs, uh, wolves, coyotes, mm -hmm. dingoes. Um, and so uh, there's there's been a lot of new research looking at that family tree. And so foxes. Uh, are, Foxes are really distributed throughout that family tree, which is pretty interesting, which means that some of the fox species are actually more closely related to uh, some of the other canids than to the uh, uh, species like the gray fox or the red fox. And so this is just a, a real coarse coverage of the family tree of the canid uh, family, right? And so the uh, genus of the gray fox, the genus and species of the gray fox is Eurocyon scenario argentius, 
try saying that five times fast. <laughs> uh, but you can see that Eurocyon is the first branch off of that family tree. So that means this is, uh, you know, one of the oldest diverged, oldest lineages of canids. And then you can see the tree branches again, and we have Volpes uh, next down on the list. And so this is uh, uh, the red fox and some of the other uh, um, classic fox species that belong to the genus Volpes. Mm -hmm. And then you can see uh, uh, a couple more branches. Um, we have the Otocyon in the next red branch, which is the bad-eared fox uh, pictured there. And then further down, the whole uh, green lineage are all the South American canids. You have maned wolves, bush dogs, and a variety of different uh, foxes. Um, uh, really, really neat uh, lineage of, of canids in South America. And then finally, all the way towards the bottom, you have the the blue lineage there, right? Which is where we finally get the genus Canis, which is the dogs, sure. uh, wolves, sure. and, and in the photo, uh, the domestic dogs, right? And then finally, all the way towards the bottom, we have Lycaon, the African wild dog. Really neat species. You can see the the orange dot there is uh, it's a hyper carnivore. So this is uh, you know a, a really neat hunting species in, oh, sure. in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the, we just wanted to show that just because we we think of them all you know uh, as foxes, these are really distributed throughout the the canine family, which is which is pretty neat to to know, right? Yeah. So the takeaway is the closer the names are, the closer the genus uh, uh, genus to the other name. The more the more related they are, is that the, right? The more closely related the they are, related and the uh, uh, the more um, traits they might share with a common ancestor. Sure. And so that might be why you know you see some some s subtle but sometimes extreme differences between the gray foxes and and some of these other fox species. Sure. I think I'd also like to point out that as Mike mentioned, the Eurocyon was that first uh, first divergence on that tree. Uh, that helps maybe explain why it's more maybe uh, has these sort of cat-like features. It's been called the cat fox or the tree fox. Um, and it, the early divergence maybe um, suggests that it's more related to some of the other uh, species that might be in the order uh, Carnivora. Carnivora, right. Uh, cool, very neat. Uh, so we had a nice overview of the global species. Uh, if we focus more on the North American uh, fox species, there are six uh, on, on North America. Um, and what we're looking at here is the distribution maps of these particular species. So the color uh, around the actual image of the species corresponds to the distribution uh, across the continent. So uh, the red fox, the red is what pops out most on this map as it should. That is the red fox species. Uh, it is on multiple continents, uh, both naturally occurring and introduced. Uh, a lot of introductions occurred in the late, uh, in the 17, 1800s just for the for sport, for uh, increased hunting opportunities. Uh, up in the northern uh, region, we had the Arctic fox, of course. Um, in the gray coloring and across North America, uh, that's where the gray fox is going to uh, be distributed. It's, it's most of the uh, United States in the uh, Central and South America as well. The uh, the orange and the green, of course, correspond to the swift and the kit fox. And just uh, on the Santa Barbara Islands, just off of the coast of California, we have another species, the island fox. Uh, really neat, uh, really neat species as well. Uh, pretty, uh, obviously, a great of the gray fox, the Eurocyon uh, genus. But this darker red section that we see uh, in eastern United States, that's where the gray and the red fox uh, are, are co-occurring. Uh, and, they're, and we see in, in North Carolina specifically that they're found across the entire state, right? Across the entire state, right. And so, uh, you know, we, we always have to keep in mind that this is, this is a, a, a broad scale, right? So uh, both foxes have been detected in every county in North Carolina, but um, looking at a, at a much finer scale is hopefully some of the stuff and questions that we can answer uh, with, with the candid critters data, sure. looking at how these species co-occur. Sure. But, um, you know, while we have these two foxes here, you know, I think we're between two foxes. We should, so yeah, I think we should go to our next segment here, uh, uh, Between Two Foxes. Great.
Okay, where are we, Mike? All right, here we are. We are between two foxes. Indeed. Yeah. Fox on my side, fox on his fox side. Fox here, too. So uh, this is a great opportunity. We're at the Museum of Natural Sciences, right? The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And so uh, we have the opportunity to showcase a couple of these preserved museum specimens so that you can really see the pelage and different morphologies of these two uh, uh, fox species that we have here in North Carolina. And so um, here is a, a beautiful red fox from, uh, uh, it was uh, collected in the 1950s. And so this is a taxidermied fox uh, preserved for people to do research, uh, to learn and, and study um, and, and outreach for education. Um, and so uh, what, what we can see here is really, really nice red pelage, the white underbelly, white undercoat, and then those black, those black leg socks uh, and markings. And so there's actually been some research that suggests that you can actually identify the individual foxes based on those different leg spotting patterns, almost like a fingerprint, which is pretty neat, I think. It's, it's probably pretty difficult to do sure, with some of these sure. photos. But, um, you know, again, that, that beautiful sleek pelage, bushy tail, a little bit of uh, dark black guard hairs, but always with the white tip of the tail on the ends there. Uh, so that's the red fox here, the Volpe's Volpe's. Sure, and, and next to me, luckily me, I have the, the gray fox species that we, uh, that we have in, in the state. And uh, just... The first, my first impressions, much darker coat uh, than the red fox. Of course, it does, of course, have a little bit of red uh, in the neck region here, uh, but overall, a much darker coat. And it's just, it's, it's not only is it, it uh, mounted this way, but it just sits lower to the ground. It sits, which again, as I mentioned, helps uh, in its climbing up trees. Uh, but some of the distinct characteristics that we see here are, of course, the black tip tail and that black racing stripe. Uh, that I mentioned earlier that goes down uh, just down the tail that helps uh, ID it while out in the uh, while out in the field of course we'll have some white markings underneath similar to the red fox um, but also just a shorter a shorter snout uh, that we'll talk more on shortly um, but yeah just slightly smaller than the red fox as well maybe a couple pounds on average uh, a smaller uh, it does have um, semi retractable claws um, that uh, helps it um, that helps it uh, catch prey, of course, and also climb up the trees. But uh, really, really neat specimen here. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, shorter snout, the shorter muzzle, because what we're going to do is look at, uh, you know, it's, it's always exciting when you're out uh, walking in the field and stuff. Uh, out, out for a nature walk, and you sometimes you find some, some bones. Uh, um, Skulls, skulls if, if you're, you're lucky, lucky right? yeah if you're lucky you find some skulls and so we wanted to showcase the two different skulls so that if you do uh you're lucky enough to find a skull in the forest well then maybe we could help you identify which fox species it is so i'm going to start here with the with the uh, red fox right and so you can see that uh pretty substantial canines right? Mm -hmm. uh, they are sure. from the order carnivora. And uh, what's really neat here is, you know, all the, all, almost all the canids have 42 teeth. Uh, so we can see all those molars, premolars, etc. But what I want to show is this uh, sagittal crest. And so remember the uh, red fox is Volpe's Volpe's. And so it, well, let's look at it this way. So this sagittal crest which is where some of the uh, chewing uh, muscles attach, you can see, actually, if you trace it, it looks like a V, right? Oh, so sure. So we have this V-shaped sagittal crest. Help lends to its name, Volpe's yeah, Volpe's. Well, yeah, for sure. And so now, if we uh, look at the, the uh, gray fox, we can see much sh shorter snout, sure. right? Smaller canines. But if we look at that skull, that sagittal crest, remember the, the gray fox is Euroscience, Scenario Argentius, and you can see that sagittal crest forms a U. And so that is how you're going to be able to tell uh, those different skulls ap apart in the field. Oh, that's and so great. you can see uh, just how much longer the the. Uh, red fox skull is then the gray fox skull but uh, Brent do you have you have sure, a couple other sure. canine skulls to show that's right so uh, we have of course the the coyote is another canine you might encounter in this state 
Uh, and we have a common dog species, right. right? Yeah, exactly. Domestic dog. And so if we look uh, at, at just holding those up side by side, you can see that, uh, you know, these are much, much smaller than, uh, you know, the Canis, the genus Canis, sure. those uh, uh, coyotes and dogs. And then I have one more oh. little little treat to show. Uh, you know, we said that the red fox is the largest species of uh, fox. Uh, you know, five to upwards of 30 pounds. And this is a preserved specimen of the fennec fox. So this is the, the smallest species from sub-Saharan Africa. This is the smallest fox species. You can see they have these uh, beautiful sand pellage to blend in with the sand, giant ears for uh, cooling and for hearing their prey. And you can see just how much larger that uh, red fox is than this, the smallest of the foxes, the fennec. Wow, it looked like a quarter of the size, a third of the oh, size. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even sure, to yeah, be honest. Yeah. It's quite small. <laughs> right, much, much smaller. So, uh, that's kind of our little treat with specimens. Uh, lots of neat research to, to be done with looking at specimens that are preserved. You know, for example, this fennec fox was collected in the, in the 1950s, and oh, it's preserved cool. for research to, to look at historical distributions, sure. and maybe now, uh, you know, Maybe candid critters. The next, the next place to go is Africa. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, that was fun. Let's transition back into uh, the by the numbers. We want to look at the data that you all have collected with candid critters. Uh, so meet us over there as we transition into by the numbers. Perfect. I would say this is probably my favorite segment. We get to look at some of the, the data that you have collected over uh, over the time the, the time of the Candy Critters project. And first up, we're just looking at here uh, the fox detections across the state. We were interested in where they might be occurring, uh, and this is what we have so far. So the the black hollow dots are where uh, we have indeed deployed a camera, but have not detected uh, neither a gray fox or a red fox. Um, but if we just look at the color. The colored dots, the bubbles, if you will, those are where uh, we have detected uh, fox species, both gray and red. And the size of the bubble corresponds to the number of times that we have detected uh, a fox at a given camera location. Um, so I guess the first couple things to take away is we have both red and gray dots across the state. The red, of course, corresponds to red fox, and the grayish color is the gray fox. Um, but we also have some bigger bubbles in different areas. So what do you make of that, Mike? Yeah, it's interesting, right? So we can see here that uh, it, it sure looks like the, the gray dots are kind of you know, distributed throughout everywhere, right? But we have concentrations of the, of the red. Uh, of the red fox dots. And so, uh, I, I don't know, I'm looking at a, a pretty big uh, uh, blob of, of dots right there in the middle of Wake County, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, where we have Raleigh and, and the Triangle area. And you can see that there's quite a few uh, uh, red fox detections in these more suburban uh, developed areas. And so, uh, this corresponds with quite a bit of research going out going on a, across the country where we can see that red foxes uh, you know uh, typically uh, are adaptable and and good at uh, co-occurring amongst humans even in fairly developed areas and so it's a question of you know hopefully we can we can answer some of these questions with the exciting candid critters data because uh, we can look at you know maybe red foxes uh, are, are gaining subsidies from humans subsidies in the sense of food or shelter sure. but they might also be uh, uh, gaining protection uh, protection from potential predators um, uh, maybe uh, by hanging out among like very close to people in urban areas they're able to avoid their competitively dominant coyotes uh, uh, maybe bobcats things like that that might not be as closely uh, adapted and, and co-occurring amongst humans in these, in these really really built up areas sure so it's probably not uncommon to maybe find a red fox standing behind your shed in your backyard exactly right, right. It seems like a good spot to set yeah. up shop for for a, a little while sure, sure. Uh, maybe avoid some of those larger predators that might be out there yeah absolutely we look at just the general numbers so what i'm showing here is the gray fox versus the red fox uh observations and deployments so observations are just the number of times we detected uh those that particular species 
And the deployments is the number of uh, unique camera locations where we have detected these species. So uh, we see here uh, not quite double, but uh, quite a few more uh, detections of gray fox and red fox across the state, and almost double the number of camera locations uh, than the than the red fox. And and this might not be what you would usually expect. Is is that right, Mike? Right. Yeah. Maybe not. I think that uh, you know having the the red fox be have such a global distribution uh, people think of it as being much more common right uh, usually associated with people and so I, I think that anecdotally uh, and and visual observations and things like that people tend to uh, assume or think that the the red fox would be more common and so this is really exciting and neat stuff to to look at uh, um, you know these data and s suggest that you know in in many s states in the central US gray foxes are relatively rare sure and and even uh, threatened or species of concern in some states uh, in the Midwest so so this is really encouraging and interesting we we really uh, it'll be exciting to to really get into these data and and um, and see what's going on at a, at a very fine scale so this is neat stuff sure just to give you a ballpark we've had maybe about just shy of 1800 detections or uh, camera deployments uh, as of this morning so we're not getting gray fox and red fox at all of our all, all of our cameras as we've seen earlier uh, but it's definitely a substantial number uh, and I'm excited to see this grow uh, this is definitely uh, we're interested in where these these two species are we're interested in how they're interacting with other uh, carnivores across the state sure. uh, so this is this is great to see that we're getting some detection yeah awesome uh, and well what type of habitat might these species be occurring in uh, would be another common question um, Generally, we say that the gray fox is, is very much a forest-dwelling species. It's well adapted to occur in there, uh, and and that's. Uh, <clears throat> but with the red fox, we generally think of that as more of a an open country, uh, grassland, agricultural uh, system type species, and and that's probably true. But but I think what this figure has, is showing that is they're highly adaptable. They're going to be occurring across, as we've shown, the entire state of North Carolina and will occur in most of the habitats that, that we have in North Carolina. Uh, there is overwhelming uh, detections uh, in the forest, uh, forested landscapes, um, but we also have quite a few there in the far left. We have uh, a, a lot of detections in the human uh, or developed areas across the state, um, even more so with the gray fox than in, than in the red fox. Um, really interesting stuff. Pretty neat, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so we saw a, a lot of similar patterns with the the distributions of of the foxes. We saw a lot of dots overlapping. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so spatially, they're occurring in the same areas, which is really interesting, uh, since they're eating a lot of the same things, using the same resources, maybe using the same den sites or den locations, mm -hmm. and so we we really need to think about how these species are able to co-occur. And so this is uh, an activity plot. And so uh, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, we have the, the, the information, the data about the time of day that we're detecting these species. And so what we can see is we can plot those out across all 24 hours of the day. And uh, what, we, what we see is that, you know, it looks like there's what uh, a general trend of nocturnal sure. behavior right a little bit of uh, diurnal activity there but what's interesting is that it even though these these plots correspond you know pretty very very close right the gray area is all the area that overlaps mm -hmm. which is the majority of the area right sure. but what's interesting is you can see that it sure looks like in the evening there's a little peak there of the gray fox before for the uh, peak in the red fox activity. And so maybe there, there's very, very fine temporal scale partitioning. Uh, and so, you know, we're gonna need to collect more data and look sure. at this a little more thoroughly. Uh, but but that's, that's pretty neat stuff. Um, sure, yeah, really yeah. neat. So yeah, the, the higher peaks is, wh is where we see the most active. So we have these nocturnal crepuscular species. Uh, but as Mike mentioned, uh, they can you can encounter them during the day, and, and and that's fine. Everything is fine if you see them during the day. It's completely normal. Uh, they can generally be a function of uh, prey availability in that particular area during that particular time of the year. Sure. Uh, 
if there's something there uh, and they're and they're after or they need to get a meal, we might see them during the day. Completely normal doesn't mean that they have any sort of disease or any sort of sickness. Uh, they're just going about their business trying to make a living out on the land, whether day or night. Yeah, right? for sure. Yeah, absolutely. They're adaptable. That's and, right. And resourceful, right? That's so right. Cool little, cool little animals. So, so they're they're in the order carnivora. Right. Uh, does that mean they only eat animals? No, actually. So uh, the order carnivora is is you know all of the carnivores, but um, just because they have really large, pronounced canine teeth. Uh, and carnassial teeth, like, like all of the carnivores do, that are really well adapted for eating meat, um, foxes and a lot of canids are omnivorous. And so, uh, you know, here is a, is a neat example. We have a picture of a gray fox with a eastern cottontail rabbit in its mouth, right? So this is a pretty large prey uh, for a gray fox, um, you know, but as omnivores, they're going to be eating things from persimmons and fleshy fruits like blackberries, uh, seeds, um, uh, a variety of different vegetations and crops, but also um, uh, all the way up the food chain, right? So you have insect, insects and invertebrates, uh, you know, slugs, worms, things like that, and then all the way up to small lizards, frogs, uh, birds, birds nests, and then small mammals like rodents or this cottontail, right? Sure, sure, yeah, definitely. This again, this next photo here, we have uh, a red fox. Um, we can we can definitely tell it's red fox. It has those clear black mittens or black uh, black legs, if you will. Uh, can't quite make out what's in its mouth, um, but there's something there. Uh, I'm leaning towards perhaps some sort of uh, squirrel species, uh, but Mike and I might be in disagreement. Yeah, about that. I, I, I'm not sure. I think it says Bojangles there. <laughs> uh, it sure looks like it could almost be a, a wrapper of some sort or something. I don't know. This this will take some a little more detective work to figure out what uh, what exactly that fox is carrying. But it sure is large, whatever it is. Sure, and I yeah. think it just I think it adds to the point that we we'll, we'll see a, a variety in their diet uh, across red red um, fox and gray fox as well. Uh, fruits, insects, uh, small mammals such as uh, mice, voles. Uh, you name it, up to cottontails and squirrels. Right, right, sure. So actually, they, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is maybe that is also why they're uh, living amongst humans and, and might actually be helping us out and providing us with some services because they're helping reduce the uh, uh, pest rodent populations, uh, you know, uh, uh, regulating some of these other uh, squirrels and, and rabbits and things that are getting into your garden. And so these are actually pretty beneficial to have around. Cool. Yeah, yeah. that's really neat. Yeah. And so uh, uh, finally, you know, we have we have the, the canines, canine co-occurrence in North Carolina. So again, I, I gotta bring it back home. This is, again, in my backyard in Zebulon in uh, Wake County here. And like, like any proud dog parent, I have to show my dogs Ash and Ember there. But, you know, before I set one of these cameras out, uh, you know, we're walking back there all the time uh, and they're smelling everything, right? And I always thought, boy, what, what's going on back here, you know, with the, and we never observe any of these, uh, of these other species. And so I thought, you know, let's see, let's see what's on the camera. This is pretty exciting. So this was in uh, October, November this past year. So there are my two dogs sniffing around. And then let's, let's go to the next scene and the, and the same. So this is that same exact spot. Oh, well, that's not, a, that's not a fox, right? This is, this is, you know, almost as as large as my dogs, if not the same size. So this is the coyote, right? Sure. This is the uh, um, the eastern coyote, and so you can see uh, he's cruising through there. He's a little bit skeptical, but what's really neat is look at that timestamp. This is on uh, what is that? November twelfth at twelve fifty in the morning. Now let's go to the next slide there. Okay. So this is that same exact location. November 12th at 2.55 in the morning. So this is 
just over two hours apart that that gray fox, the gray fox, right, you can tell from the pelage, came to that same exact spot uh, and, and passed right by where that coyote was. And so this is, this is really the interesting data that we could look at this, this very, very fine scale uh, temporal partitioning. But remember, November 12th, let's go to the next slide. There. There's more. There's more. And now here, look, we have two uh, red foxes kind of in the distance, but we can tell they're red foxes. We can see their long, kind of pretty lanky, lean yeah, legs, yeah. but those dark middens and that, that nice uh, red pelage. And so here's probably a pair of red foxes. Mm -hmm. And look at, the, look at the date. The same day, uh, you know, obviously there was the afternoon passed, but this is all within 24 hours. We're detecting dogs coyotes and both species of fox all at the same location so there's there's certainly some interesting stuff going on here in north carolina i think this is this uh the candid critters project is providing us with tons of data to look at these really really uh neat neat research projects looking at the at the, these different canines. That's awesome. That's yeah. really neat. Thanks. So we yeah. have this, I'm pretty proud of it. We have this spatial overlap, <laughs> and they're separating maybe through the time throughout the day. Uh, that's really cool. Excited to see what more data is going to be coming in. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed our segment on the uh, catching carnivores series that we've put on with the North Carolina Canid Critters. Uh, this was our again our fourth and final installment. Um, and now we're ready to take uh, questions. From those of you that might be uh, tuning in live, uh, go ahead and type your question into the comment box, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, we're, we're here on standby um, to, to discuss any questions that you might have uh, about the two species. Okay. All right. So I think we got some questions coming in. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Uh, so the first question is from Jerry. Uh, Mike, why don't you take this one? All right. So Jerry asked, uh, so foxes occur on every continent except Antarctica. Were either or both species introduced to Australia are both native to North America? Jerry, that's a great question. Uh, all right. So remember, we looked at that uh, global map, right? And we had Australia. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, we had Australia was full of the red foxes there, right? And so uh, uh, the red fox was actually introduced to Australia in, I, I believe, the 1700s, yep. uh, around then uh, when, when Australia was being colonized. And so uh, red foxes have, you know, like we showed, they're pretty adaptable. Uh, uh, they're super, uh, you know, super... Um, good at exploiting resources sure. and there are some other potential prey that have been introduced to Australia as well things like uh, uh, European hares right mm -hmm. so so there's actually rabbits in Australia that were introduced so that's an additional prey resource for the red foxes gray foxes have not been introduced um, in uh, in Australia um, but the other neat thing to think about with the red foxes is that they are uh, that they are native to uh, uh, Russia and and uh, Asia mm. and uh, even into parts of China and across into uh, you know all across Asia and uh, all of Europe. Uh, so this is a really really adaptable kind of a really well distributed species even in parts of northern Africa. Um, and they're native there. Sure. So the only place that the red fox uh, is is truly uh, exotic is Australia. Well, they're exotic in, in quite a few places, but uh, where, where the biggest introduction was was in Australia. Sure. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, there were historically some red fox introductions in the in the U.S. when it was colonized uh, for hunting, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, new new genetic research suggests that. Uh, most of those were were drowned out with the native foxes. Oh, really? So there's only a tiny bit of of genetic uh, um, uh, uh, genome genetic data that suggests that there's still a little bit of the European foxes lingering. Um, and yes, both are both foxes are native to to North America. So uh, that was long winded. No, but... very cool. That was really informative. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question comes up from uh, Lisa. 
Uh, Lisa says that we know uh, that uh, coyotes occur statewide. Do you know whether coyotes uh, have any effect on foxes' distribution, activity, or behavior? Great question, Lisa. Uh, as we just kind of shown on our last segment when we're looking at canine co-occurrence, um, they're definitely spatially overlapping, and we see some we see some partitioning maybe uh, temporally, mm -hmm. uh, but. But there's also been some research outside of North Carolina that suggests that maybe uh, sometimes coyotes are displacing uh, some of the fox species. Yep, absolutely. Uh, they do have a lot of overlap in their diet and uh, mm -hmm. their habitats that they use. Uh, so we would expect that there'd be some sort of competition, uh, sympatric competition amongst the canines. But uh, what we're seeing in North Carolina anyway on the Can of Critters data is that we're having a lot of spatial overlap. The species are co-occurring across the state. Uh, maybe. Uh, as Mike showed on his property, uh, differentiating amongst the time that we're that we're detecting them. Right, right, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it is important to note that you know, uh, with among the canids, you know, there is a hierarchy, right? So you have the foxes are are the are the smaller canids, right? And then up 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 the uh, chain of of the hierarchy. So you know, coyotes tend to be dominant over competitively dominant over foxes and then of course wolves competitively dominant sure. over coyotes sure sure uh mike why don't you take this next one <laughs> what do you know dave uh asked what do you know about threats to our domestic dogs from di from diseases that fox may spread specifically rabies and parvo uh that's that's a good question uh, uh, certainly a valid question, especially because uh, foxes are a rabies vector species, right? And so uh, they are one of the of the uh, species that are that are monitored and 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 kind of uh, sentinels for things like rabies detection, right? So some of the other species that uh, that carry that you know commonly carry rabies would be things like raccoons and skunks, sure. uh, maybe bats, um, but. You know, I think the the important thing is that um, rabies rabies kind of ebbs and flows, right? And I, I think there's some some interesting research where uh, where you can see that it, it's kind of cyclic. And so uh, I don't know of any recent rabies outbreaks in North Carolina, um, but I, certainly certainly that uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be monitoring. Um, you know, maybe this is a really good opportunity to to start screening some of these species. Parvo is another one. I, I'm not really sure uh, about the distribution of parvo. Uh, kennel cough. Parvo sure, is sure. kennel cough, right? And so, um, so, so there's certainly uh, uh, quite a few opportunities to conduct research. Um, but you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that things like uh, rabies and parvo, uh, you know, are also perpetuated um, by you know. Uh, feral or free roaming dogs sure. um, and things like that and so they might they might also uh, uh, be a concern um, things like also distemper can be amongst uh, you know a variety of the canids or uh, just domestic cats sure, as well sure, sure. Uh, Daniel comes in with the next question are foxes solitary or pack hunters uh, in general uh, most often we have their solitary species uh, they will occur uh, in um, a mate. You might see uh, mates going through together, as Mike had on his cameras. He yeah. had two uh, two red foxes uh, on this at the same camera at the same time. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, solitary species. Right. Yep. Yep. For the most part, uh, for in general, uh, I guess only when they're having young. Sure. Uh, um, okay. Carol's uh, next question. Uh, why don't you take this one, Mike? Okay. Sorry, we can switch Carol, back and forth. thanks yeah. for the question. Are foxes related to the Russian Kolinsky, uh, in parentheses, the sable? Boy, I'm glad she said sable because I did not know what the Kolinsky yeah, is. Uh, if, hopefully that's the right way to pronounce it. Uh, so the sable, right. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so the sable, uh, I, I'm... A sable fox is a is a is a variety of the uh, pelage of the red fox. Oh sure, sure. sure. Right, and so uh, the Russian foxes. You know, there was a lot of uh, fur trade and and actually breeding foxes in Russia um, for uh, for fur coats and things like that. Oh, okay. And so there's actually been a, a, a lot of neat research that I encourage people to go read about. Is the the Russian foxes. And um, uh, that were bred, and they selectively bred 
red foxes to be um, uh, um, less bold, right, oh, and sure. less aggressive. Yeah. So they selected for uh, lower aggression and, and kind of the most uh, docile foxes were the only ones that they selected to breed. And what they found was a lot of the foxes, after only, you know, uh, um, several generations, were, were showing characteristics like domestic dogs. Oh. And so it showed that some of these docile genes were linked to other genes related to the pelage. And, um, and so some of those, uh, so, for example, the, the sable, uh, that doesn't mean that the wild foxes that have that darker sable pelage are, are more docile or anything, but um, some of those darker traits are associated with uh, um, you know, traits that we that we kind of select for in domestication. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Jeff comes in with the next question. How often do gray foxes climb trees? And is it just to escape predators? Uh, this is a cool question. So I don't have I don't have data on exactly how often they spend uh, or how many times they're going up and down in a tree. Um, I would say it's pretty frequently, and it's not just limited to uh, escaping predators. It can be to just hide out for the day. If they just want to lay low for a little while, they can hop out on a branch, lay low. It could also be in search of, of food, right? So during the during the fall, during the mast season, uh, gray, gray foxes absolutely eat mast. Uh, they could reach up in the tree uh, and, and access that, uh, or some other fruit that that tree might be bearing. Uh, a nest predation on birds. Mm -hmm. Maybe yep. they're after some eggs, or maybe they're after young in the trees. So, while well, it does serve as a great way to escape uh, predators, it can also be just to access some additional resources. Uh, there's documentation of them nesting in uh, tree cavities, uh, so they can use it for uh, <laughs> uh, uh, ne nesting, um, nest uh, for nesting as well, um, or so, excuse me, denning, right? Um, but. Uh, yeah, so it's not just not just limited to not just limited to predators. Cool. Well, we have an update here. Uh, the Kalinsky sable is actually a weasel. <laughs> uh, sable is a t is a color morph of foxes, so that's I why that's what I was they were talking about. Yeah, that's what I was a little bit confused there. Um, so I'm not gonna delve too much deeper into that. Fine. I've I've talked a little bit about the pelage of foxes and and selection uh, uh, that was done with the domestication of some of the foxes. Um, sorry about that mix up. No problem. What's the next question say? Is hunting trapping popular in North Carolina for these species? Uh, thanks Mary for the question. Um, so I'm not totally sure. Definitely trapping on the red foxes. I think yeah. that's a very common thing. Uh, I would imagine that trapping uh, or hunting for the gray fox would be common in the event that this is some that there's some sort of nuisance uh, to the, to some landowner. Um, but I, I know that I know that uh, red fox hunting and trapping is a very uh, active active area mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for sports people. So that's a cool question. Uh, we can look more into it for the gray fox. I, I'm with Mike on that one. I'm not entirely sure about the gray fox. Um, Gray fox species. There's there are certainly seasons for them. And, oh, definitely. Uh, and so uh, uh, presumably it's it's occurring. I'm not sure how popular it is. Sure. Um, you know, the fur trade has uh, uh, has kind of isn't isn't too popular right now. It's not. Uh, Pelts so, aren't bringing in much money. Right, right. They're not as lucrative as they were. Um, you know, back back in in the founding fathers' days. Sure. Sure. Uh, Another question, Terry and Daniel, uh, they want to know what is the lifespan of uh, both species of fox? Um, I can speak to the gray fox. I know it's pretty rare, and this might uh, uh, be the same for the red fox as well, it's rare to get them above five or six years old in the wild. Mm -hmm. They generally have a shorter lifespan. Uh, one to two years is really common. Three to four years is probably, probably around the average, I would guess. Um, five to six, maybe uh, on the high end. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, the thing to keep in mind is that when they're uh, kits in the den, they're pretty susceptible to quite a few predators. Uh, and so red foxes, pretty similar. You know, in, in ideal conditions, they could live uh, up to, you know, 10 years at a zoo or something, you know, like that. Um, but in the wild, usually, you know, two to three years, sure. quite uh, on the lower uh, end of the spectrum, because they're, they're dealing with, 
uh, finding resources, uh, dealing with competitors and predators, vehicles, unfortunately. Sure. Uh, um, you know. Yeah. This was this has been great. You guys have provided a lot of really really fun questions yeah, for us to fun. think about. Yeah, um, I learned about the Kolinsky sable. The Kolinsky <laughs> sable, not to be confused with the sable morph of the red fox. Right. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, go ahead and please uh, add them into the comments box. We're happy to answer them while we're here. Um, if we don't actually answer them before the, the live setting is over, perhaps we, somebody can come back and answer them in the comments section. Um, again, we really appreciate your time in uh, tuning in to the Catching Carnivores series. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, just as a recap, if you missed some of the previous uh, videos on the Catching Carnivores series, they're on our YouTube page. Uh, we've covered the, the coyote, uh, the bobcat, and of course, the uh, American Black Bear. Yeah, that was a great episode. Yeah, Check that one neat. out if you haven't yeah, seen it yet. Absolutely. Uh, stay tuned or keep an eye on this page for updates on the uh, North Carolina Canter Critters Project. We, uh, I believe, have a scheduled uh, update sometime coming soon, in the, uh, maybe around August or beginning of the school year, uh, where we'll update you on our progress about not just species that we've we've covered here in the Catching Carnivore series, but all but all about all species that we've captured or caught uh, or documented on the cameras. Yeah. Uh, and if you haven't deployed a camera, there are what we're calling some uh, desert uh, desert counties where we desperately need uh, data collected in those counties. So please see our website, nccandidcritters.org, to find a map of where we have cameras uh, deployed, where we do not have data. And if you're brand new to the project on information on how to get involved with uh, the Candid Critters project, uh, and get a camera uh, deployed on your property, on your favorite, uh, at your favorite hiking trail, uh, wherever that may be that you're interested in where wildlife is, we're interested too. Uh, so please help out if you can. Uh, and again, thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was fun. Thanks. Cool. Take care. All right. Thank you, everyone.